And now I get to introduce my colleague, our executive director, Adrian Brodeur, our moderator tonight. Adrian is an award-winning editor and author who has served as a judge on the National Book Award, the National Magazine Award, and the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award. She also founded the literary magazine Zoetrope All Story with Francis Ford Coppola. Her highly anticipated memoir, Wild Game, will be published in October, and we can't wait. So, um, so please join me in welcoming Adrienne Brodeur and Aspen Woods Literary Prize winner, Tiari Jones. Thank you, Carolyn. And thank all of you for coming tonight. Welcome. And um, mostly, I am just so excited to be on stage with you, Tiari, um, who, as you all know, is the author of the best-selling book, An American Marriage, which you now also know won, you may have heard, the Aspen Words Literary Prize. But Tiari is also the author of three other novels, Silver Sparrow, The Untelling, and Leaving Atlanta. And in addition to winning the Aspen Words Literary Prize, <coughs> excuse me, um, an American marriage just won the prestigious Women's Fiction Award, formerly known as the Orange Prize. <laughs> yes. An NAACP Image Award. It was an Oprah Book Club suggestion. It appeared on President Obama's summer reading list as well as his end of the year roundup. Um, the novel has been published in 15 countries, or is it more already? <laughs> um, and when she's not traveling around the world accepting prizes, uh, Thierry is a professor of creative writing at Emory University. So welcome to Aspen. Thank you for having me. <laughs> So as you might know, we're in the thick of Aspen Summer Words, which is our writing conference. And so although we cannot see the audience, um, I am imagining that out there, there are many aspiring writers and writers, and also obviously lots of readers, um, who might be under the impression because of all this that you are just an overnight sensation when in fact um, you've been in this game for a long time. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your history and how you got from a to superstardom. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've been a person I've loved to write all my life. I think a lot of people who are writers started writing as children. And I used to write little books and staple them, and I felt very, very satisfied with them. And my parents, who are here, mom and daddy, raise your hands. Yeah. They're there on the front row. <laughs> You know, they indulged me in that, so when I was a little girl, I was under the impression that I had, you know, a body of work. But, <laughs> but I didn't, I mean, I do see now that very young people are super professionalized now. Like, my across the street neighbor, his daughter is eight, and she's in, like, some kind of writing program, and, you know, she came to my house to do a reading. You know, like this. <laughs> But I think that for me, I developed as a writer because I had no attention for being a writer. Like when I was a teenager, I enjoyed writing, but no one ever asked me, you know, what are you writing about? What are you thinking about? And I think, I think it's because of a lot of things. I think one, when I was growing up, people just didn't pay attention to kids like that. And I think more importantly also that as a girl, I think as a teenage girl, the question of your life is not what are you thinking. The question that people want to know about you as a teenage girl is what are you doing and what are you not doing. And so the question is are you nice? Not so much are you a writer, what are, you, are you an intellectual, it's just are you a nice girl? And if you like to read and write, people think that you are nice because you know, as I often say, no one, to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever gotten pregnant in the library. <laughs> I don't know that that's true. <laughs> I don't know where you live. <laughs> but, you know, when I got to college, I started taking, took writing classes, and I started thinking, oh, maybe I could do this thing as being a writer. I wanted to go to graduate school to study creative writing, but 
Well, actually, when I finished college, I did not know that there was a such thing as a graduate degree in creative writing. I actually went to the University of Iowa to do something else. I went to the University of Iowa to get a PhD in, in literature, and there were all these people, and they were like, oh, we're in the workshop, we're writers. And I would say, oh, I, I write, I'm a writer. They're like, no, no, you don't understand. <laughs> you know, we are in the workshop. And I was like, what's the workshop? <laughs> And that's when I discovered that you could do a degree in creative writing, but I didn't, I was afraid to do it because I didn't have any models of people living their lives as artists. I, and um, I was really encouraged to get a PhD. Um, I introduced you to my parents. That's like Dr. Mama and Dr. Daddy. They both have PhDs. And so they were like, you should get a PhD. And everyone was like, yes, as one does. <laughs> and I wanted to, I wanted to study writing, but it, I wasn't from a space where that made sense to study writing. But finally, I do believe that when you, when you believe in what you're doing with your entire heart, I believe that if you do your part, the universe meets you halfway. Because when I was about 27 years old, I started writing a novel um, about growing up in Atlanta during the Atlanta child murders. And I had a chance encounter. I'm sitting down so you all can't see it, but I'm a very tall person. And all my life, I feared this just a matter of time before I ran over a petite person. I just <laughs> knew it. And when I was about 27, I got in an elevator and I ran over a petite person. And I was like, oh my goodness, petite person, are you, are you okay? And the petite person said she was fine, that apparently this happens to them a lot. And she was the director of a creative writing program and she had read the one story I had published. Oh. And she said, you know, come to Arizona and work with me. I'll help you. I'll be your mentor. And I was like, oh, no, ma'am, I can't go to Arizona. I said, it's really hot in Arizona. <laughs> and this was in the 90s. And I said, and besides, you know, they don't have the king holiday. <laughs> but she said, it's only hot in the summer, and we have had a voter referendum, and I will have you a king holiday by the time <laughs> you get there. And so that's when I wrote my first book. But I feel like that when I decided that I would do what I needed to do in order to write that first book. It was almost like when I proved that I was serious, mm -hmm. then the doors opened and I, and I wrote my first book and I got a, you know, I graduated from my MFA program with my book in my hand. And that's kind of how I got started. And then I thought, oh, this publishing thing isn't so hard. People say the publishing thing is hard. It isn't so hard. But since between the time of my first book and my fourth book, there have been more than one occasion when it looked like I was told that my career was over, yeah. that I wasn't selling enough copies, that maybe I should write again under a pseudonym. And I was thinking that, you know, this is my name. This is who I am. I don't want to write as another person. But I was told that would be the only way to save my career. Well, you've saved it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, to, to get into the specifics of an American marriage, I understand you were at um, Harvard with a fellowship, and you were studying wrongful incar incarceration and that you sort of understood the territory of the book, but you hadn't yet kind of found the characters to populate it, is this right? And, th and then you kind of had inspiration in an, in an unusual place, and I was hoping you'd tell us that story. I had done all this research on the topic of wrongful incarceration, but I didn't have the inspiration that I needed to write a book, mm -hmm. because I think that good fiction lives in a space of moral ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And when I was studying wrongful incarceration, well, they call it wrongful incarceration because it's wrong. There's really nothing else to say yeah. on that. And so there was, n there was no place where I could kind of challenge myself to stretch and think further about something. I see. When I was just looking at people who had been treated so wrongly. Right. So I didn't know what I was gonna do, but then I was in Atlanta and I was in the mall and I saw a couple arguing. I could tell that they were in love and in trouble. The woman was beautifully dressed, the guy, he looked okay, and she, well, she looked fantastic. Shoes, belt, bag, the whole nine. That's why I was looking at her. And I heard her say, clear as a bell, she said, Roy, you know you wouldn't have waited on me for seven years. And I looked at her, I looked at him, they looked at me, and I felt like we all three of us knew he wouldn't have waited on her for seven years. <laughs> but then he looked at her and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. This wouldn't have happened to you in the first place. Wow. And 
I felt like he was right too. And when I have a situation where the characters are in conflict, they disagree, but everyone's right and no one's wrong, then I know that that's a story that can support a novel. And that's how I decided to write the novel about a young couple separated by a wrongful conviction. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're glad you did. Um, and because of the billing of this uh, particular talk, which included Oprah, could you tell us what it was like to get that call? Well, you know, <laughs> I think of the many pleasures of being Oprah, I mean, I'm sure there are pleasures of being Oprah that we can't even imagine, but of the many pleasures of being Oprah is changing people's lives, and she likes to make the call herself. So I was driving my car, minding my business, and there was a blocked call. I answer blocked calls <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm nosy. Like, this might be good advice to all of us. <laughs> somebody blocked that call for a reason. It's usually not a good reason, but there's always a reason why someone blocked the call. So I answered. I said, hello. And it came through all the speakers in the car. And she said, hey, this is Oprah. <laughs> and I said, ma'am. <laughs> And she said she had read my book and that it wasn't even, I said, it's not even out yet. It's not even, and she says, people give me things. And I said, <laughs> I guess they do. <laughs> and she wanted to use the book for the book club because she said that she felt like it was an accessible way to raise these larger issues. And, and what did I think about that? And I told her I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and would you read a few pages from your book? So we can all have a taste of it. OK. This is, um, Oops, sorry. am I doing that? Sorry. <laughs> this is from the point of view of Celestial on the day that her husband is arrested for a crime he didn't commit. I have to put on my glasses. Lately, I feel like the writing in books has been getting so much smaller. <laughs> what I know is this. They didn't believe me. Twelve people and not one of them took me at my word. There in the front of the room, I explained that Roy couldn't have raped the woman in room 206 because we had been together. I told them about the magic fingers that wouldn't work, about the movie that played on the snowy television. The prosecutor asked me what we had been fighting about. Rattled, I looked to Roy and to both our mothers. Banks objected, so I didn't have to answer, but the pause made it appear that I was concealing something rotten at the pit of our very young marriage. Even before I stepped down from the witness stand, I knew that I had failed him. Maybe I wasn't appealing enough, not dramatic enough, too, not from around here. Who knows? Uncle Banks, coaching me, had said, now is not the time to be articulate. Now is the time to give it up. No filter, all heart. No matter what you're asked, what you want the jury to see is why you married him. I tried, but I didn't know how to be anything other than well-spoken in front of strangers. I wish I could have brought a selection of my art, the Man Moving series, all images of Roy. I would say, this is who he is to me. Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he gentle? But all I had were words, which are light and flimsy as air. As I took my seat, not even the black lady juror would look at me. It turns out that I watched too much television. I was expecting a scientist to come and testify about DNA. I was waiting for a pair of handsome detectives to burst into the courtroom at the last minute, whispering something urgent. Everyone would see that this was a big mistake, a major misunderstanding. We would all be shaken but appeased. I fully believed that I would leave the courtroom with my husband beside me. Secure in our home, we would tell people how no black man is really safe in America. But 12 years is what they gave him. We would be 43 when he was released. Roy understood that 12 years was an eternity because he sobbed right there at the defendant's table. His knees gave way and he fell into his chair. The judge paused and demanded that Roy bear this news on his feet. He stood again and cried, not like a baby, but in a way that only a grown man can cry, from the bottom of his feet, up through his torso, and finally through his lips. As Roy howled, my fingers kept worrying a rough patch of skin beneath my chin a souvenir of scar tissue. When they did what I remember as kicking in the door, what everyone else remembers as opening it with the key, after that door was open, however it was open, we were both pulled from the bed. They dragged Roy into the parking lot, and I followed, lunging for him, wearing nothing but a white slip. Someone pushed me to the ground, and my chin hit the pavement. 
Roy was on the asphalt beside me, barely beyond my grasp, speaking words that didn't reach my ears. I don't know how long we lay there, parallel like burial plots. Husband, wife, what God has brought together, let no man tear asunder. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, what, uh, during your research on wrongful incarceration, what parts of that entered the book? I mean, were there, were there very specific areas that were helpful in that research? I was really interested in what I learned from reading um, oral histories of people who had mm -hmm. been wrongfully incarcerated. And I was looking really for what I call the minutia of deprivation, because prison is brutality and prison is monotony. And those are not things, those things don't work very well narratively. Yeah. So I tried to think, find from the oral history small details that would let you get a feel for the emotional terrain mm -hmm. of the experience of being in prison. And one of the really interesting things I realized when I was reading all these oral histories is that even though these men and women had been wrongfully convicted, the wrongful, that wasn't really the question that they were answering, that they were really critiquing incarceration and mass incarceration more largely. They s tend to bristle at the idea of even using the term wrongfully incarcerated because it implies that everyone else is rightfully incarcerated and that actually deflects from the critique of the system. Right. So that's why when I was writing the book, I don't spend all that much time on Roy dwelling on the, but I didn't do it part. Yeah. I mean, there is one part where he says to Celestial, but I'm innocent. But then his wife says back, I'm innocent too, because she is also innocent. So I was more interested in the effect of this family separation. Right, right. And that yeah. was so beautifully portrayed through those letters. And one of the things, um, this is kind of veering into wonky craft territory, but that I just found so amazing about this book were how distinct the three first person narr narrators were. And is that how it just came out for you? I mean, did you consider third person? How did you get to that place? First person is my favorite point yeah. of view. I enjoy it. Um, I think it's, I think, I think a lot of the ways that we write and a lot of the craft decisions we make actually reflect also our personalities. Mm -hmm. um, I'm good at, I'm good at voices like, if, I'm good at like mimicking people also, which is kind of what a first person point of view is, right? It's like you are channeling the mannerisms, et cetera, the, the addiction of another person. But I, when I wrote this book, I actually had planned for it to be a single point of view. I wanted it to be about Celestial, the wife. Um, so I wrote the whole book about her from beginning to end. And there was so much pushback from my early readers. Everyone was saying, this story doesn't feel complete. What about her husband? What about her husband? And then I got defensive, because I felt like, can't a woman have a story? Like, right. does, his, does his story have to be there to make her story have a right to exist? Right. And, but finally, I decided to write his story, and I wrote his point of view. And his voice came to me very easily, which was surprising to me, because you know he's a man, I'm not a man. And why could I write his, his voice so easily? And I know there are a lot of people who think that writing a novel should be, it should be like love. If it's easy, then it's right. But I also believe that writing a novel is like love. And if it's easy, I'm very suspicious. <laughs> And I realized that I could write Roy's point of view so easily because it was a very familiar story. One man against the system, and he's just fighting to get home. He wants to find his wife. He wants to find a, a faithful woman and like a clean house. And it was so familiar. One, it is a very familiar kind of trope in African-American literature, but also it's a very old Western story. I mean, that is the question of the Odyssey. Right. And so I didn't want to just write like a black modern reboot of the Odyssey. Right. So I decided to toggle his voice and her voice because that's a new story. Like in the Odyssey, we don't know what Penelope really right. thinks. So I toggled the two voices and I thought that that was good, but I felt like Roy as a character was feeling constrained, that he was feeling symbolic, like he was a symbolic representation of the black man. So every time he made a decision or something happened, I felt like there was a voice over my shoulder saying, so what are you trying to say about the black man? 
And it was just like in real life, I'm sure we've all been in a situation where we felt like we were representing more than just ourselves. Mm -hmm. Even if you were, felt like you were just representing your family, you feel like you can't be eccentric anymore because everyone's reputation is on your shoulders. Right. And so that's why I decided to add a third male voice, just to give Roy some room. Right. And with the two of them in the story, they could each be themselves because they didn't have they were, not, they were no longer symbolic. They became individuals again with their own quirky opinions and mannerisms and worldviews. Right. And, and one of my favorite parts of the book, and I know there's, I mean, there's so many reasons that it won this prize, and obviously it's wrongful incarceration, and it's, it's race, and it's so many things, but it's also um, gender. And, and there was an expected role for Celestial to play, which she did not follow that narrative stand by your man role. And, um, and I'm really curious how, what the reaction overall has been to that, because I, I can picture a few people not <laughs> sort of hoping for the other, the other outcome. Well, the biggest challenge, I think, in writing a story is what I call the, is, a, is pushing back against what I call the tyranny of genre expectation. Mm -hmm. When you have a genre, as a reader, when you have a genre expectation and the book doesn't meet that expectation, it, <coughs> it makes you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's where, con before there's controversy, there's discomfort. So when I, used, when I was writing it from her point of view and I would say, oh, I've written a novel, it's about a woman and her husband has been wrongfully accused, everyone expected it to be a novel about one woman's brave, chaste fight to free her man, right? Like, and we would develop her character based on how beautifully she suffers, her endless, bottomless sacrifice. And that's also a way that we understand women's role in this issue of incarceration is the extent to which they support and suffer in the absence of, of their men. Like that, there's that support system role is how we understand. Right. And one, I was bored by that. I was bored by that as an idea. I wouldn't read that book, let alone write it. It took me six years to write this book. I wouldn't spend six years rehashing that story because it doesn't answer, it doesn't raise the questions that, the question that I have about this is, my feminism is intersectional. Mm -hmm. And if, if I were to say to you, I'm writing a book about a woman and her husband is away, she never sees him, and she wants her own life, you would say, by all means, she must, right? Absolutely. You would say, get free. Right. But when, and there are a lot of novels with that kind of story where a woman is unhappy in her marriage for whatever reason, and, but usually they're novels about middle-class white women. Mm -hmm. Because should she leave her marriage, there's no sense that her husband is in despair. Right. Right, you just feel like, you know, you never, like when you read um, an Antonia Nelson short story, like she can break your heart with that kind of storyline, but you never really worry about him. <laughs> but in this situation, Celestial's husband is wrongfully in prison, but does that mean that she doesn't have a right to her life anymore? Mm -hmm. And then the question is, of a gender expectation is, is it more selfish for her not to wait, or is it more selfish for him to ask her to wait? Yeah. I've, I've seldom met anyone who questions the fact that he thinks that she should wait. Although, I've been on book tour a long time, I've met a lot of people. When I was in San Antonio, I met, a man came up to me, he was well dressed, a black man, suit, tie, you know, he just looked, he even had the little, what's that little thing you put on the tie, little tie pin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, he went all out in his presentation. And he said, he said, this happened to me. He said that he went to prison for a crime he didn't commit, and he had been married. He said, but that he told his wife to divorce him. He said he didn't see any reason for her life to stop, too. And, wow. and he said, and she did it. I said, she did? <laughs> he said, she divorced him, and she remarried. But he said that the three of them vacationed together. <laughs> But then I said to him, well, did you ever get married again? And he said, no, she's the love of my life. Oh. Um, you said that it took six years, which is not a crazy long time. It's a long time. Six years is a long time. <laughs> OK, so you took a long time writing this book. So Forever. What, what was the heart? What, where did you get stuck? Was it finding those characters? Or what was the? 
Uh, okay, so writing Celestial's point of view from the beginning to the end, that's mm -hmm. a year and a half. Okay. Then six months later, that's Roy. That's two years. Then I, I spent about a year getting Andre together. That's three years. Then I decided, I spent like a year figuring out what order. But I got stuck for about 18 months, 50 pages from the end. I just <laughs> got stuck. And it, that's 18 months. That's a long time. That is a long time. And my, I was living in Brooklyn at the time. My editor lived around the corner. I was running into her in the grocery store. I was hiding from her. I was hiding like behind the rotisserie chickens. And her children would say, but I saw her. <laughs> but I got stuck because I was asking myself the wrong questions as to how to end this book. Right. I was allowing Roy, the character, to tell me what this book is about. Roy believes this book is a story of what he has lost and who can give it back to him. He feels like he's lost his job, his status, right. you know, his car, his woman, everything. And he thinks the moral measure of every character, and thereby the moral measure of the narrative, is who will help him get back what he's lost. And so I thought that was the question of the book. And I, I couldn't find a way out that was satisfying for all my characters if I used this as a measure. But then one day, I realized that what Roy really lost was his citizenship in his own life, that he had forgotten that in order to be a contributing member of your own life, you have to give something to other people. Right. He, and that was what was taken from him, his understanding that he had something to offer someone else. And so when I realized that, I realized that like the arc of the book, I was, it was, it was off, like, because it was racing toward the wrong end. Right. And so then it only took me about a week and a half, two weeks to finish it, even though I had been stranded, because I realized the right question to ask. Wow. Well, that's hopeful for, for those of you who are stuck somewhere. <laughs> well, and, and the thing that was really important to me that I feel I should say with so many writers in the audience is that the, everyone, we all complain about how our jobs don't allow us to write, mm -hmm. but this book was so far overdue, but because I had a day job, I didn't feel like, I because I was under a lot of pressure to write a different book, to write the expected book. Right. I mean, someone even said to me, you should put some more Black Lives Matter in this book. <laughs> you know, like I have some Black Lives Matter in my pocketbook and I could just like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> until we have enough Black Lives Matter. But I would rather not publish a book than publish the wrong book. Right. But I could say that because I was not looking to the book to keep a roof over my head. Yeah. That when the book yeah. was late, I was embarrassed, I was depressed, but it, I wasn't, it, it wasn't threat, it wasn't existential. Right. And so I just kept working on it. And I was prepared to repay the advance. Yeah. It wasn't a big advance, but I had spent it. And so, you know, it was like, you know, no more, no more mimosa, no more Uber, mm -hmm. because I was saving up, because I'd rather not, I would prefer not to publish at all. Yeah, okay. Um, and yes, that deserves some <laughs> clapping. <laughs> Your title, An American Marriage, is such a powerful title. And I have to admit that I heard you answer this question once, so I'm really, I just, it moved me so much. But would you tell the audience the story of how you got to this hard-earned title of yours? It wasn't my first idea. I'm not very good at titles. Mm -hmm. When it comes to titles, I don't know if I told you this. When it comes to titles, you know when you're like 15 and you have a notebook and you're writing all the names of your hypothetical children? And it's always too much, you know, too many accent marks, you know, just too many letters, too many syllables, too many silent, just too much. And that's how I am when I write my ideas for titles. It's just too much. And they, the editor always says, no. Yeah. So when he said, no, I was ready for it. And I said, well, we'll brainstorm and come up with a title. And I said, I was just being funny. I said, we should call this an American marriage. And he said, um, really? I said, yeah, because when you say something's American, it sounds important. And I even like, told him that my cat was writing a memoir. It was going to be called American Feline. It was going to be about being a house cat in Brooklyn. <laughs> and he said that he liked an American marriage as the title, even though, and I said, no, no, I'm going to come up with something else. So I kept coming up with all these new titles, and he didn't like them. And I wasn't crazy about them, but I just kept trying. And finally, he said, why don't you like the title An American Marriage? And I told him, I said, I feel like An American Marriage sounds like a book about some white people in Connecticut 
experiencing emotions. <laughs> and he said, well, Connecticut is such a small state. Why do you feel that what happens in Connecticut is more American than what's happening you know, to your characters in Atlanta? And the reason is that I have never, as a person, I've never been called American without another word in front of it. I've been called African American, I've been called Black American, but no one has ever called me just American. So when he wanted to call the book an American marriage, I felt like he was estranging me from this story that I was telling. He was taking it, making it no longer about me and, and my characters. But he asked me to think about it, and I went and I talked to my mentor, playwright Pearl Clegg, and I said, Pearl, they want to call it an American marriage. I thought, I said, do you think they're trying to disguise it where you wouldn't you know, know who had written it? And, and she said that, she said, first off, it's a great title. And she said that it reflects the book because the incarceration in this country is like no other. Mm -hmm. And so this story is an American story. But she said, but it's more importantly, it's an American story because, she said, because you are an American writer. She said a lot of people made a lot of sacrifices so that you can claim your citizenship. Mm -hmm. She said, if you don't like it because you just don't like it, you don't have to take this as your title. She said, but don't reject this title because you don't feel that you have a right to it. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, that deserves applause too. <laughs> well, I told my editor, I said, okay, let's call it an American marriage. And he said, oh, thank goodness, because we already made the cover. <laughs> 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 Such a good line. Um, so at, at the risk of being slightly self-serving, I would be interested to know what winning a prize like the Aspen Awards Literary Prize means to you, or actually winning any of your prizes. Like, what, what does that mean to an author? Well, different prizes mean different things yeah. because different prizes have different goals. Right. The Aspen Words Prize, I think it's such an important prize because writers or particularly um, those of us who've come up you know, through the MFA, mm -hmm. you're really encouraged not to write about issues. There's a sense that it, your art is undermined by engaging with the, with the yeah. issues of the day. And a prize like the Aspen Word Prize that celebrates this very thing, it's very encouraging, I think, to writers. And I think it also, it also, you feel like someone saw what it was that you were trying to do. Yeah. And that what, and it, all of us have something that we can contribute to the issues that we care about. Each one of us, some of us are writers, people do different things, like no matter what you do, what your life's work is, can be used in the service of justice. And I think this award, this award in particular, you know, emphasizes that. Awards are tricky, I mean, because if you don't win an award, the first thing the people who love you tell you is that does not matter. <laughs> like if you don't win, like when you don't win and you're sitting there, you're embarrassed. They said, and the winner is, and it was some other person. Your friends, they take you out for drinks and they say, oh, awards are stupid. Don't worry about awards. They're all rigged. It doesn't matter. Um, but it is wonderful to be seen. When you write a novel, like I spent six years, I felt like I spent six years laboring privately, you know, without, without, you know, without a like, a fave, or anything like that. You're just doing it on your own. And to be, to be seen and recognized, it, it, it feels good. Oh, good. <laughs> it's certainly nice to give them. <laughs> um, and was there, was there anything in the writing or in actually in the reception of the book even, what were the things that were surprising to you, the utterly unexpected <laughs> moments along the way, either in the writing or just in how this book was received, because I've actually read your other books. They're beautiful. I mean, they're oh, all as good as this. And, 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 you know, but this struck in some ways. And um, so what, what? Why did, I don't know why this book, you know, took off in a way that the others. I think part of it is that the political climate we're in, yeah. I think that when, in the good times, readers don't have as much appetite for work that's critical of society, yeah. but in, in dark political times, I think people are looking to our artists, saying, yeah. you know, what is the way forward? So I think that timing is part of it. Um, the most surprise, well, the book surprises me all through it. I don't know the plot of the book when I'm writing it, so when, when surprising plot twists happen, yeah. I'm as shocked as anybody. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not going to, how can I, I'm not going to give a spoiler, but, like, but when a certain character revealed 
his true identity. Yeah. I was like, get out, what? <laughs> and then when I read back through it, I saw all these hints along the way. So I said, I guess that is who he is. I mean, for me, a book, I like to have the same feeling of breathless anticipation when I write a book as you feel when you're reading a book. If I know what's going to happen at the end, just like if I spoil the book for you, you are not as motivated to finish reading it. If I spoil it for myself by working the plot out too many steps ahead, I'm not motivated to finish right. writing it. Right. Now it's such an interesting tension, sort of plotting but still allowing the freedom for those moments to happen. But I mean, I really don't know. Like I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't okay. plot more than just a couple steps ahead of where I'm going. Okay. <laughs> Which is also, I think, why it takes me so long. Yeah. Because when I go down a bad plot place and it doesn't end up anywhere fruitful, I have to go back to the last place that I was confident and then start again going this direction. Yeah. So it takes me a long time. The most rewarding thing that has happened to me are meeting people who, when you, I feel like when you write a novel, when I write a novel at least, I like to imagine that the book is being read by people who have firsthand experience with what I'm writing about. Mm -hmm. and, and that it makes them not so much, I'm not try, I don't try to write a book to be a f uh, like a cheerleader for them, but that I want to raise questions about their lives, but I also want them to feel that their lives are understood. And that has been satisfying to meet people. I thought that I would meet more people who have been incarcerated themselves, but I'm meeting, I met a lot of people who have tangential relationships. I met a young man who said his father had been in prison for his life, his whole life, and that he was angry with his mother because he didn't feel that she was playing the proper role, and mm -hmm. that this book made him understand that his mother is a woman, a person. Has a life. <laughs> and that was one of the most important moments for me on my tour, was to meet him. Oh, wow. Well. I feel like I could ask many, many, many more questions, but I don't want to be a complete question hog. So um, we have about 10 more, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I've got more if you don't have any, but if you guys have some questions out there, I know we've got people running around with mics. I'm not going to be able to see easily. So, oh, there we go. Okay, right back here in this corner, just hang on, Ellie, or whoever's coming down on this side, right in here. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm wondering um, if you have considered working with communities of incarcerated or families of incarcerated uh, with your very socially engaged work. Well, I have done a number of like book clubs in prisons um, with, with this book. And I've done some work with the Marshall Project in looking at policy. It's so interesting being a, being a novelist. I sometimes feel a little out of my element when I'm with people who do a lot of policy work, you know, because they, they know all these, all these different bills and referendums, so many acronyms, and I feel like I'm the one without the acronyms. I wonder, <laughs> as a, I wonder if, as a novelist, maybe my work is better accomplished in, in bringing the books, because because of mass incarceration, there's so many people tangentially, uh, uh, tangentially touched by incarceration who are not in any organization. And I think that this book has really helped in getting people out of that shame. There's so many people that I know that have incarcerated family members, and I didn't even know this about them, and I've been knowing them forever until we read the book. So I wonder if that might be more where my work works best. That's interesting. Any other questions? Oops, there's one right down here. Um, this sort of dovetails with what you just said because you're not a policymaker, but I wonder your thoughts on the Central Park Five and what just happened with Oberlin um, as sort of bookends to what's going on in, in your novel. I think wrongful incarceration is a problem as old as the United States, right? I mean, you could, you, I mean, you could look at slavery as the ultimate in wrongful incarceration and exploit it of captive labor, right? Like it's a very, I think the Central Park Five with the Netflix documentary, I think a lot of these topics are getting a lot more tra traction and attention, but you know, it's not, a, it's not a new, it's not a new problem, but the solutions to it, I think, 
are the real issue in that when people are released when they're wrongfully incarcerated, most people who are wrongfully incarcerated don't get any money or anything when they're released. Uh -huh. Most people are not even formally exonerated. They will just like vacate the conviction, which is not exactly the same thing. But just imagine if you're in prison and they say, you can be out tomorrow or you can go back to, to trial and what would you pick? Most people just choose to get out tomorrow and they don't get anything. But I do worry though that, again, when we lean so much on wrongful incarceration, does it left the rest of the system off the hook? I mean, there's so many people in prison for low level drug, you know, low level, low level drug offenses. Mm -hmm. And yes, they did do the crime of which they are convicted, but is what, do they deserve what happened to them? So I do try to, I've been trying lately to kind of lean away from the wrongful part to engage more with the question of our system of incarceration. Yeah. Whoops. And since it's taken, oh wait, you've got someone right there. Um, I loved your book. Oh, thank you. I really you. loved your book and so did my husband. We've talked about it a number of times, mainly because you left the identity of the woman who was raped to the reader's imagination. Um, whether she was white, the, the book would be one way. Whether she was black, you could see it almost in a different way. And kind I, of, right? Yeah, no, really. Um, as a white person, I, I don't know. I was just thinking about it, and my husband too, and I thought that that was a brilliant move on your part. And I wonder whether you know who she was. I do know. I think that this now this is a wonky craft thing, <laughs> but I often I always tell my students that you always have to know. You can decide to withhold that information as a writer, but you can't not know right. because the shape, the way the story goes, depends on that information whether you reveal it or not. I decided not to reveal the. I was very tricky. I didn't want to go down the rabbit hole of what happened that night. I think that genre expectation is that if you have someone who's wrongfully accused of a crime, the book is gonna be about solving the crime, right. which then makes it about the police. And it, I felt like it could, we would lose the focus on this family. And um, Toni Morrison has a short story where there are two girls, have you all read this? There are two girls in foster care and they're having all this racial drama between them, but it's never revealed which one of them is black and which one of them is white. And if you teach, your class can argue for the whole like hour and a half over that. So I call myself kind of winking at Morrison there, but also I didn't want to, I didn't want to get lost in the historical antecedent to that question and not be able to move forward. That said, you know where it's going to hem me up. Mm -hmm. The movie. They're going to have to put a person <laughs> in that role. Right, right. See? Right. Mm -hmm. I was like, can't we just put her in shadow? <laughs> they were like, no, <laughs> we cannot. You have to make a decision. And so I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh. And also, truthfully, I don't know if it's going to be up to me either. I was going to say, you have that yeah. control. <laughs> no. Um, were there other novelists or writers who were who you winked to in this book or just who inspired you greatly as you I, wrote? I feel though in this book, I wink to Morrison throughout because mm -hmm. there's an underappreciated Toni Morrison novel called Tar Baby, which is my favorite. I feel like when I teach it, my students don't like it. I get mad at them. I stopped teaching it. It was causing problems between us. <laughs> but um, the, some of the questions raised in this novel, some of the gendered questions yeah. are the same. I even use the hometown of the hero in that book is Elo, and I use the same name for the hometown in, in this book. I also, I really did think of myself as reworking the Odyssey. Yeah, interesting. And, and I did, did you read Circe? I read Circe, yes, I also read The Circe. Silence of the Girls. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of women now are writing back to mm -hmm. the Greeks. And I think that I am too, but I'm, I'm seldom recognized as doing that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, right in front in the blue jacket. Don't you think that we're, all the questions are coming from up here? I know, I think it's me because I can't see anyone. I think those people in the there. back are not getting the love they deserve. Okay, I see She's had her hand up forever. Back. Okay. I'm so bossy. <laughs> I'm going to let Tiari pick the people from now. Well, no, but these people, they've been having their hands up. Okay. I believe in justice. That's why I'm here. <laughs> all right, Adrian. It's Issa. Uh, hi, um, Issa. But I... Uh, I'm curious, now that you bring up uh, Circe and weaving, and 
This is a crafty question. Uh, how you got to Celestial's art and what the inspiration was because the dolls. She, the dolls. Well, I wanted to write about a woman that is an artist that I knew I, I was just interested since it's such a part of my life. And there's so much conversation in this book about babies and who has babies, who doesn't have babies. So those, these dolls as kind of surrogates were interesting to me. But I was also interested in um, what I call the ethics of portraiture, which I struggle with as a writer. I sometimes am inspired for details of characters from people I know in real life. Sometimes they, sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't. And like I have a friend, he says, you, you keep stealing my best stories. And I tell him, I haven't stolen anything. First off, you still tell that story. So obviously, <laughs> I haven't stolen it from you. But I don't use his stories anymore because it bothers him in some way. And with Celestial, when she and Roy are first married and her dolls look like Roy, he loves it. And then when he is in prison, he's angry because he feels like she's stealing his story. So that's one of the questions. And also, I felt like doll making, I have a friend who is a doll maker, and I'm impressed by how many hours and how like she's ruined her eyesight, you know, wearing magnifying glasses to do the, 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 the bead work and all the details. But when she's finished, she can spend years on a doll, yet it's still consumed like, oh, a doll is a toy for girls. And I feel that's a struggle that all women artists have. Like I know me, I'll, I've written a novel, I'll be on the plane, I'll sit next to a man and he'll say, so what do you do? And I'll say, oh, I'm a writer. He says, oh, did you write a romance novel? And I'll say, no, I've written a novel about the, wrongful, the um, collateral effects of wrongful incarceration. And he'll say, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll buy it for my wife. Because <laughs> you know, he can't understand that I've written something that could be of value Serious. to him. Because that's the way women's art is so often consumed. But at the same time, I'm delighted for his wife to read my book. <laughs> Who would you like to? I just I just wanted to know if you could expand upon just for a moment about the idea at, of how you sit down to write and not have your story plotted out. What is that experience of you're just sitting down and it's where fun. <laughs> it's really really fun. it for me. I when I came to writing as a little girl, I came to writing because it was a pleasure for me. And as I got more professionalized, it became more like work and more like more deadlines. It, it took me away from the joy I had that made me want to be a writer. But when I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know how long the book will take, I don't know, I don't know anything, and there's, it takes the pressure off. Even though you would think it would put pressure on to not know, it, it reminds me that this is out of my hands. And so what I do is I try to set how much time I spend writing. I can't control how many pages I write in a day. I can't control how many words will come to me. I can only control how much time I spend trying. And so I have like a um, egg timer, you know, the ones you wind up, and I have to sit there for two egg timers worth. And if and whatever I've written by then, it's a good writing day because I tried for two hours, and that's all it takes. And I find that the pages stack up, and it works, and it's. Sometimes people say, well, you don't know where it's going, you don't, but that's the, that's the pleasure. The pleasure is in that ride. My egg timer only goes four minutes. <laughs> really? I'll send you one. I'll send you one. That would be a short day. Okay, I see a hand right here. Could you tell us about the movie and where it might be going? You know, I don't really know that much about the movie. They don't really like to have the author that much in the mix. I, I thought that maybe I could maybe try my hand at writing a screenplay, but I've never written one before. But I went to meet with the woman who was writing the screenplay, and she said something that made me very clear that I needed to you know, kind of stay in my own lane. And what she said was, we were talking about the end of the book, and she said, you know, this book ends with an epiphany, a change of mind, a change of heart. And I was like, yeah, I know. And she said, that is not interesting for a movie, because an epiphany is not interesting to watch. She said, an epiphany looks like this. <laughs> She's like, nobody wants to watch a movie that ends like that. <laughs> and that is when I realized that it's a whole different creature. So I just decided to get out of her way, 
but I am I'm very excited about the idea of it, even though I have to say this, I am not a person. I don't believe that books grow up, graduate, and become movies. I think it's a, a different piece of art, and I'm excited to see it. That sounds great. Um, I'm seeing hands in the front, but are there any others in the back that have been up that I haven't seen? Yeah, because we can't really see the people in the back. Anybody in the back? Okay, so okay. then okay. right up we'll front here. To, wait, wait, there's one in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so <Aww>. close. <laughs> Sorry. I guess we could take the one in the front while she's going to meet the one in the back. Okay. There you go. We're getting to you right here. The mic's here first. Uh, hi. hi, thank you so much. Uh, I just have a quick yes. question of content. You know, you mentioned babies and dolls and kind of this ever-present theme. I was just curious when I read the book about the topic of her abortion and kind of how that played into the larger storyline. Like, what, what purpose did that serve, I guess, in the larger plot, if any? What purpose? Like, the, I mean, their relationship would have been scattered and shattered, perhaps, as it was, but you made the choice to add this pregnancy and this termination into it. What, you know, did that act as a, as a wedge towards the end of their relationship, or? Well, I would say, like, when I'm composing a novel, I don't think about th things in that way, but I was, interested in, again, genre expectation. Usually, if you have an abortion in a story, the story becomes about the abortion, right? It becomes the center of it. You know, it usually is some spiraling of a great tragedy, or it haunts her for the rest of her life, all these kinds of things. But if you look statistically at the percentage of American women who've had abortions, it's not the central plot point of their life. And so I didn't want it to be the central plot point of this story. I think that part of the, I think it's important that we write novels about the ways that people really do live their lives. But I was interested in the idea that they didn't have children and that Roy, you know, people always talk about women trapping men by having children, but actually women get trapped by children more than vice versa. Like yes. that is, and so Roy keeps thinking, if I had, if, if she, if I had a son in the back room, she wouldn't be able to say that to me. If we had a baby, she wouldn't be able to leave me. Like his whole thing, it's like he missed out on that baby as that lock on her. And so I was just interested in kind of subverting that and being kind of unsentimental about it. Yes. Nice question. Hi. So I'm a white guy from Connecticut. <laughs> Are you experiencing emotions? who is not particularly in touch with his emotions. <laughs> you were speaking to me when they're there. Um, I'm just, it sounds like you knew you were an artist you know, long before you became a teacher, although I, I don't know that, but I'm curious how, how your role as a teacher, as a professor, um, you know, informs your writing. I, I understand it kept a roof over your head and it has a, has a function, but does, does the teaching um, in, you know, inform your writing and your art in some way you could share with us? I think that being a teacher saved me. When I wrote, when I was writing my third novel, that's when I was told that my career was finished and that I would need to get a pseudonym because BookScan, that's that computer program that tells them how many books you sold, my BookScan wasn't good and no one was interested in publishing me. I had written a book that I was writing as a gift to my sister. I was about halfway through it when I was told that I was done. And I teach, and I tell my students that you write the story that your heart tells you must be written. You don't write for a market, an agent. I don't even like to talk business with my students. I tell them, when your book is finished, we can talk business, because no one has ever been half finished with a book, and the business helped them finish. So how could I face those kids every day if I were to abandon my own book? because of the fact that I couldn't find a publisher. How could I face them? So they kept me honest in that way, and they kept me moving forward on my book, and I, I thank them in the acknowledgments of that book, because if it wasn't for them, I would have given up. Thank you. I think that that is all the time we have. Um, thank you, Tiari, for coming. Wait, wait, something's wait. happening. I think the question is, do you trust the screenplay writer with, you know, 
with your book? You know, I feel like the book, the movie is another work of art that someone else is doing. And just like also with the, with the, even with the book itself, one thing I've learned in writing is that all I can control is what's on the pages. You know, like I had to trust my team with the cover. Um, I probably wouldn't have made this cover, but this cover, you know, really worked out. Every, there's so much involved in going from the words I've written on the page to having the book in the world, and the same as in the movie, that you just have to trust the other creatives around you. And every time you put yourself out there, be it in a book form, in movie form, whatever, you just have to trust that something is bigger than you and is guiding it and that the story will somehow reach the people who need it most. And I would, whoops. Sorry about that. <laughs> I would just like to say that cover does work, and that little aspen leaf that's been affixed looks especially fetching. <laughs> and there will be books for sale after this, um, after our conversation, which is going to end now. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much. <laughs>